Our second plenary speaker for this evening is Dr. Joel Berger. Dr. Berger is the Cox Chair of Wildlife Conservation at Colorado State University and a senior scientist for the New York-based Wildlife Conservation Society. He has written five books, including Horn of Darkness, published by Oxford Press, and The Better to Eat You With, published by the University of Chicago Press. Dr. Leopold, Dr. Berger received an Aldo Leopold Lifetime Achievement Award and a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Society of Conservation Biology. He is an elected a fellow of the American Conservation for the Advancement of Sciences, and his work has been, has been supported by the Guggenheim Foundation, the National Science Foundation, and National Geographic. His work has taken him to Central Asia, Africa, and in 2016 to a remote island in the Asian Arctic. To quote from his bio, his work, he works with species larger than a bread box. Maybe you could help me understand that. Dr. Berger, welcome. So I want to thank Jerry, um, I want to thank Pathways, and um, in contradistinction to Dan, I want to thank the Department of Human Dimensions. <laughs> um, I have an unusual request before we get going. Um, we're going to show, I'm going to be showing slides. If you're sitting way in the back, like probably 30% of this room is, you should redistribute. We're going to kill some lights, but I'm suggesting you redistribute so you can actually see some of the pictures. I'm going to show mostly pictures but I think you should move. Um, we're gonna wait one second in case anybody wants to. Um, and I'm gonna, I guess, go kill some lights. People don't see muskox. They stand, they stand. We can watch the wind blow. We can watch the snow coat them. A species that's been there for a quarter of a million years but when you see black dots scattered across a hillside, there is magic. Thanks, thanks for attending. I'm gonna talk about extreme conservation. And I wanna begin now with a couple of questions for you in the audience. So, if you know who Bruce Coburn is, please raise your hand. Okay, so for the 90% of you who don't, Bruce Coburn is a Canadian folk singer. And one of his tunes deals with, he has a ditty, and I'm not gonna try to even sing it for you. But he talks about if a tree falls and nobody's in the forest, how do we know that it fell? And we're all empiricists at one level or another, so what would we do? We would go out and we would look. All right, so that was my first question. I'm gonna ask you two more. Second question is, is a species extinct until we can prove that it's extant? Or is it extant until we can demonstrate that it's extinct? We're gonna go one deeper. It's estimated that there's something like 15 to 20 million species on the planet. If two or three million went extinct and we haven't uncovered and described them, how would we ever know that they existed? Here's my point, that conservation has a lot of uncertainty about successes in the long term. And I wanna deal with some of those today. For instance, if we go to villages and subsistence hunters off the coast of Barrow, Alaska, from where this picture was taken. The Inupiats who live there know that ice conditions are changing, bowhead migration systems are changing, and their, their food security is not as secure as it once was. We also know that we can't just say climate change is in one place and not another. We're all part of the planet. We're all part of this system. We all have common challenges. When I think about the global challenges, we can really boil it down to two. And these are related. I mean, Dan talked about the humans in every bit of an appropriate fashion as is possible and conceivable. And of course, 
were linked with climate. Now, when I think about global leadership, I don't think about this person. In fact, this person I don't think ever thinks about science or data, but certainly not ice and glaciers. What I'm going to do today is to focus on extremes. Extreme environments, such as high elevations, like at 20,000 feet. But we can also think about extremes, such as deserts. And we can think about some of the species who live in places that we would consider stream. Now, of course, there are no penguins in deserts, but there are penguins on four continents. There is the woolly bear uh, caterpillar, which takes seven years to hit maturity in places like Greenland and in Alaska. We can also think about some of the large mammals, places like the Namib Desert that receive less than two inches of pre precipitation a year, but yet they still support species like rhinos and elephants and lions and giraffes. We all know that conservation was born as a crisis discipline. And we, have a, uh, as a culture, have a, an odd habit of looking backward. It's like, where are the best 50 places? Where are the last 50 places to go see before X, Y, or Z disappears? And I think it's important not to be thinking about the last, but to thinking about where we can maybe shape and do things differently. So I want to talk about opportunities. And I want to showcase some opportunities. And I start with human densities. We've talked a little, a little bit about that in terms of um, what Dan had talked about for humans across the globe. So let's look at what the global average is. And then we can ask, well, where's Colorado fit? Or where's the US fit? Or where does Liberia fit? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus in, on places that are generally low density. I'll talk about Arctic Alaska. I'll talk a little bit about the Asian Arctic, I'll talk about Tibet, I'll talk about Mongolia. These places represent opportunities. There are lots of ways to do conservation. I'm not even close to suggesting people should focus solely in one place or another. Diversity is our strength. Diversity in so many realms is a strength. But what I tend to do is to focus on cold, on high, on low, on bare, on dry. And I'll take you through some of this. I'm going to use today snow oxen as a metaphor. There is no such species as a snow oxen, but I'm going to use it as a metaphor for species that occur in low, dry, high, remote areas that are related to these kind of goat antelopes or ox. I will talk about science, about muddy boots, and about society and how we can think about their connectedness. And I'll talk about successes and failures and use endangered and less endangered species and lessons we've learned from some successes. So I want to begin in Central Asia and talk about people and economy. This species is called a saiga. Saiga are the world's most northern antelope. They occur both in Kazakhstan primarily, but also a different species in the Gobi Desert, maybe a subspecies. There's some quarrels there. Their Pleistocene distribution was large, northwestern North America over to England, shifting to Mongolia. In Kazakhstan, a conference attended by 12 different countries, one of the recommendations were, was as follows. Some 800 saiga left, extinction is imminent, it's necessary to capture and bring them into captivity and start a reintroduction program. We've certainly seen that approach before. Pandas, black-footed ferrets, condors. We also know that breeding centers are expensive. Captures are costly, as are the risks of mortality. And numbers count. We know for golden lion tamarins, it was expensive, but they've gone from Smithsonian's National Zoo into the Atlantic rainforest of Brazil. Efforts have focused on Asian rhinos, of which there are three species, and the Arabian oryx. But maybe keeping animals in the wild is not only a potential goal, it is a goal. And so what we've put in place is a program to work with Mongolian scientists to count and to train and to figure out how many saiga are there before we blow the whistle and say, let's bring the rest into captivity. So we've worked with a number of Mongolians, shown here in your bottom right, uh, Bouvet Bater, 
who finished his PhD recently at University of Massachusetts. And that other picture on the left is we brought together police, military, herders, and scientists, and taught them also why we were doing different kinds of sampling. We published our work. Estimates were not 800, but somewhere between six to 12,000. And as a consequence of the science, but clearly with the training component, the center plan was abandoned, the science mattered, and the kind of approaches that have been used in se several other countries um, are now commonplace in Mongolia. But I'm also gonna talk about something that I consider a failed attempt. And I'm gonna talk about biodiversity and economies. And I'm gonna shift gears and I'm gonna deal with more people and more complexity. And I'll talk about the US and I'll talk about China. Some similarities, notice the eastern seaboards are next to um, oceans and that's where the population centers are. If we look at total area, similar. Population differences, for about fourfold. About 10 times as many large cities, a million or more in China than in the US. There are similarities, as I pointed out, crowds in the east, Beijing in the top, New York on the bottom. If we go west, we have open space, Tibetan, Qinghai Plateau, Rocky Mountain region. We have ecological sur surrogates, Chiru, which were the mascot for the Beijing Olympics in 2008. No, not pandas, but Chiru, and also pronghorn. And so the question that I want to deal with at this point is how, does, what, how do Western cultures, ours, affect regional biodiversity? And I'll draw your attention to the Tibetan Plateau, to India, and to Mongolia, shown here, but point out also that the Gobi Desert is not part of the Tibetan Plateau, it lies to the north. Collaborators, mostly local scientists, NGOs, some zoos, play an important role. An introduction to traditional Central Asia, beasts of burden, yaks, camels, and goats. Goats. When Cecil Rollins, who is a British military officer, visited this realm, he talked about animals living at the highest of elevations, and there they had the most profuse or thick fur. This was called Pasham. You can go to airport shops in Bangkok and find Pashmina. You can find it's marketed over in Milan and other ports in Italy as well as in France. And today we know it as cashmere. If we look at the cashmere demand in trade, 90%, 90% of the world's cashmere comes out of China and Mongolia. So how does consumerism affect biodiversity in Central Asia? So let me go through where we've been working and what we've been doing. And I wanna introduce you to our study system and our species and our tests. And so these are Kiang. They're an endangered species living about 15 to 17,000 feet. You can see here a glacier breaking down. So we've got some climate issues going. These are wild yak, also an endangered species. I think the world knows that, well, they certainly some of the world knows something about the song by the coasters called Yakety Yak. Again, I'm not gonna try to deal with singing this stuff. Um, there are 14 million domestic yaks in the world, 10 to 15,000 wild yaks. Again, an endangered species, high elevation. Chiru, I mentioned them as the mascot for the Olympics. Endangered, also at 15 or 16,000 feet. There's Saiga, also blue sheep, a mainstay for snow leopards. Snow leopards, a threatened species. Tibetan gazelles, common. Four other endangered species, Bactrian camels, Hulan, which is the equivalent of Kiang in the Gobi Desert, so low elevation wild ass, Tahi, Przewalski horse, back in the wild now because of the efforts of zoos. And then finally, Przewalski horse, nowhere to be found in a zoo. And there are people. We find that 25 years ago, the highest villages in Tibet were at 14,000 feet. Now they're approaching 17,000 feet. 
there are lots of land use changes and conflicts. Rather than horses and yaks being used for transportation, we now have motorcycles. We now, rather than yak hair tents, we have canvas tents. But people and lifestyles obviously matter. People wouldn't be here at this conference if that wasn't the case. We know that there's a strong reliance on livestock and goats. And what are some of the consequences of shifting in goats? And so let me just show you one of a couple of data slides. So across four decades, we can see both in India, in blue, and in black, Mongolia, the change in the growth of goats, some three to five fold increases. So let me flip back for a second, and let's ask about the relative abundance of some of the T and E species that I've just been talking about in protected areas across Ladakh in India, Mongolia, as well as in Western China. So what I have here are native ungulates in black. The stippled are going to be the proportional abundance of livestock. The point here is this. Three to eight percent of the total in protected areas are native ungulates. Here, domestic trailing across the Altai Mountains, an area that is shared by snow leopards. So I'm going to give you a test just in case you're dozing off. Where is the snow leopard in this photo? Okay, I'm going to give a couple of hints before I give you the answer. So this is what it will look like when you can put your eyes on it. I'm going to move the snow leopard to the quadrant that it is in. I think I'm going to move the snow leopard, yeah. Okay, so it's going to be in your top left quadrant. And there it is. Okay, so let me sum up where I'm at so far. There's an intensification of ecological effects as a consequence of goats. Diet overlap, displacement, reduced reproduction, but something that's not on the radar are dogs. Dog-associated predation is occurring on almost every one of these T and E species. There is one free-ranging dog on the planet for every 11 people on the planet. That's not much of an issue in the US, not much in Canada, but in other parts of the world, it is a massive issue. Here's an example of several different argali, which are the world's largest sheep, being injured or killed. So what's missing from this conservation equation? As James Garville would say, people stupid. People and their livelihoods. And so when we think about what the incentivization is for people who are raising goats, of course it's a change in their living conditions. They're doing better three to five fold raising cashmere than any other crop that they can do right now. You can go to Santa Fe, just down the road here to the south a couple of hundred miles, and find scarves for 20 bucks or 15 bucks, 13 to 25 bucks a piece. So this isn't a food web. What we're looking at is a chain link, but it's uh, driven by people and obvious aspirations to improve their lives. So should poor herders care about these international agreements or diversity? I mean, if I was a poor herder, I know what I'd be doing, and it would not necessarily be thinking about what the legal agreements are. So how do we move forward? And as Dan and as probably every person in this room would claim, it's not the biological realm that's going to help us win. It's the human realm. And so what do we do? So what our interest was with respect to Saiga was to understand what the people who live with Saiga and with goats and other endangered species think. And so we had a series of next steps. Some of these involved getting um, their opinions, but all, some of it was also putting out at least into the Western world, some of the conflicts that are being faced. What we've also been interested in doing is putting to set together workshops at the end user place, places like London, places, places like Paris, places like New York. I missed a couple of slides in here that actually showed the workshop dimensions, but we had the local people crafting what they thought was reasonable that they could live with. What are the solutions? The solutions obviously are beyond the biological, but some of the things that we learn is that domestic yaks, domestic camels, they have a far lesser impact on the land than do goats. People are trying to market yak wool to camel wool,
but this is not yet palatable to the public. But what we do know is that ostrich feathers were once very important in people's styles. That changed quickly. We know that change can come. We didn't succeed here. It's not over, but we've been trying for 10 years and we haven't made much progress. So I'm gonna to talk to, about something different. I'm gonna talk about climate degradation that could be viewed as climate change, but from the people of perspectives who are living on lands and being challenged about their food, they consider it a degradation. I'm gonna start though and ask from an animal perspective before I move to a people, per, a people perspective, what does ice recession mean? I'll look at two different places, the top of the world, the Arctic, and I'll go back to the roof of the world, the Tibetan Plateau. I'm gonna talk about two species. I'll talk about musk oxen. I'll talk about wild yaks. Both of these species have long skirts. We don't know what climate change really means to their biology or their potential persistence. We do know that warming is extreme, two to three times faster in the Arctic. We also know that the same rate is characterizing the Tibetan Plateau. In fact, the Tibetan Plateau has something like 45,000 glaciers. Of the 800 that have been studied, more than 95% are in decline. We don't know much about what the changes in snow and cold regime will be mean for other cold adapted species. These are mountain goats, um, which occur here in the Rocky Mountains. There are other cold adapted species. We don't have much of an idea. We know what the models tell us, but we don't have much empirical information. So let me work you through the life um, in the periglacial zone. This picture is at about 16,000 feet. You can see the yaks at the base. So I want to tell you about an unanticipated, but what I think is a cool finding, and I'm going to follow this with asking you a question. And so the question is going to be, which sex of yak, males or females, are more susceptible to heat forcing? And I'll come back and do this again in a moment. I'm going to look for you to raise your hands. Um, so what I'm going to tell you about are based on different expeditions we've been involved with over on the Tibetan Plateau. These have included icons like George Schaller, but mostly with some of the local people that I work with uh, from the De uh, Wildlife Conservation Society. Um, and recall, so I'm going to talk about winter where it's cold and it's frozen and there is no free water. So which sex is going to be closer to snow, males or females? If you think females, raise your hand. Okay. If you think males, raise your hand. Okay, more people in the audience think males will be tied closer to snow than, fem uh, than females. Okay, well what we find is that females are 20 times closer to snow patches than males. 20 times closer. In the winter, so this is desert. This is desert, but it snows, the snow disappears, vaporizes, sublimates. So why are females closer than males? Well, possibilities are size differences. Males are about twice the size of females, so maybe there's something going on with metabolism. Maybe it's physiology. Maybe it's reproduction. But recall, we're talking about winter when it's minus 20. Minus 20 Fahrenheit, so that's maybe about minus 25 centigrade for those of you who are more comfortable um, and like most of the world is in centigrade than us guys. Um, here's a hint why. All the water is frozen, no free water. Females need water. Why do females need water in the middle of winter? They're still lactating. It's like lactating at minus 20 degrees, yes. And this is not something models would have told us, but muddy boots did because we're, or actually frozen toes did because we're out there in the middle of winter. Um, and so what happens when the snow patches disappear? And if you don't have the link, the best way for domestic livestock to access a liquid is snow if they can't have water. And so as the snow vaporizes, thousands and thousands of uh, acres or square kilometers of habitat are disappearing. So let me switch and go from Tibet up to Alaska. And I'm gonna take us to an area called Beringia, which is where Asia once connected to North America. And I'll draw your attention, not to the yellow line, which does show where snow was, but instead to our two study areas for the last 10 years that have been in Western Arctic Alaska. 
But then I'll also point out Wrangell Island in Asian, um, the Asian Arctic, it's Russian, uh, Russian territory. So when President Barack Obama visited the Arctic, he visited places like Kotzebue and Kivalina. This picture is not of an island. This is the real thing. This is Kivalina with sea level, um, and it's not an island. But something unusual happened six months before the president's visit. In fact, it was February 2015. What happened that was so unusual is that it rained on snow in February. In fact, for three days, the temperature never dropped below 32 Fahrenheit. When this kind of an event happens, an impenetrable ice jacket is formed and species can't access their salad. The food kitchen closes. They have to subsist totally on their body fat. And so what are the approaches we have to understand climate impacts? We're doing a lot of modeling, which is good. You know, we're using a lot of metadata, which is good but we don't actually have as much empirical. And so I want to tell you very briefly what we've been doing, and that's focused on relationships between mothers and young. And we're asking questions about how a young individual's growth rate in its size at birth affects its later size, its puberty, and its survival. What we do know is that being small is a handicap. And so we're using as a metric head size and we're going to measure the head sizes of babies of one-year-olds and two-year-olds. But we do this not by playing cowboy biologists and bringing in the Blackhawks and tagging hundreds and hundreds of animals. We're going to do this through non-invasive methods. And we're going to look at the role of gestation, of summer food, and winter weather. And these latter variables that I just talked about, we can get these because of advances in satellite telemetry. And what we can do is look at and, po and ask, how do these affect head size? And we can connect all these lines directly and indirectly, and we can have a very good modeler, this particular one, Cindy Hartway from WCS. And to really measure head size, though, on the ground, the one thing we can't get out of the satellites is you can notice the tepid sun, you can notice the herd of muskox, you can notice the person walking up for photos. And when we do this, we can photograph every animal, we can then use different kind of algorithms with computers to generate different measures of their head size. We can also go out and find animals because we have to, and we do this working with local people who have knowledge of the landscape, and we work intensively with them. So if rain on snow events and gestation are affecting growth, hence the gestating fetus, what we could do is look across time, and what we find is that when rain on snow events occur during gestation, that the babies are compromised at least until puberty, sometimes a lot longer. And so we do know that there are some subtle but extremely important effects that are affecting populations of muskox. I want to go deeper. So I'm going to do this in a different way. And ask, what happens when ice recesses? We're getting novel ecosystems. And so I want you to notice where Wrangell Island is. Let's see if this shows up. Uh, no, okay, try it this way. Wrangell Island is about another foot and a half above this. Watch what happens to Wrangell Island over the next couple of months as the snow, um, as the ice recedes. Okay, the ice is gone. Less ice, more polar bears stranded, more polar bears on land. Different kind of system than we've usually had. Now we're going to go back to the polar region's largest land mammal, musk oxen, heat intolerant. Group defense is important to musk oxen. In fact, they're well known for these kind of circular formations that keep offspring inside. Wherever musk oxen have been examined, this kind of system is invariant. It doesn't change. Herd structure protects. So let's go back to Wrangell Island. What are those white things in the picture? No, not the gulls in the front. Those things in the, in the yellow box. What are those? We'll go closer. 
those, those, those are all polar bears. They're not on a whale carcass. Those are polar bears on land. 12 in the box, another nine outside the box. And so when we start to think and ask, what are the consequences of ice recession and, and intensification of ice? What's gonna happen in these kinds of systems that are changing so rapidly? And so one of the questions we're asking are, how vulnerable to predation are musk oxen? And is it better if you're a musk oxen in these defensive structures to stand your ground or to flee? And the reason this is important, and the reason this has conservation relevance, before I come into the human dimension again, the reason that this has relevance is because we need to know whether or not there's an opportunity to musk ox, for musk ox to make it, whether they're just going to be toast. We can't look to Greenland for answers, because there aren't many people out there in the middle of winter watching these interactions. Same is true in Alaska. So how do we learn about the responses? Well, we do know that musk ox, I'm sorry, that polar bears need ice to hunt seals, but we do know that they will eat land mammals, including caribou, when they can. Grizzly bears are colonizing Arctic islands in the mid-central um, parts of the Arctic and the Canadian Arctic. We know that they're omnivores, but we also know that they're very capable predators that can run up to three or four miles in a chase. So are musk oxen going to be dead meat? That's the question. If they're not, we're going to expect that they're going to learn rapidly, or maybe bears are just poor hunters. And the same predictions we would make for Arctic Alaska. Now here's where it gets interesting. How do we develop any kind of an idea whether this is the case? We're not talking Serengeti, we're not talking Yellowstone. You can't drive up in your Land Rover or um, in your RV and actually watch these interactions because these are low density places. So what do we do? We can use animal models. Two Nobel laureates used this for insects and for birds, never for mammals. But what we can do, and what I'm interested in doing, is to use these kind of animal models to understand musk ox interactions with polar bears and grizzly bears. So to do this, we have to go to Wrangell Island. But because of the US and Russia's very warm relationship right now, you can't just jump over from Alaska. Instead, what you have to do is go 21 time zones around the world, Moscow, and then another time zone, nine time zones east. So you board a plane with your model, you have your model, your fake bear, you put it next to you, and you ignore the horrified look of the people next to you because you are not worrying about that human dimension. You land in the garden spot of the world called Pivik, Russia. Once there, you're arrested, you're incarcerated, even though I'm on US government dollars. Thank you, Dan, um, but they were not your dollars. Um, but you're released, you arrive, you have your new home, you have your good strong coffee that you hope works, and you go to the library, and you think in the library maybe you'll find something about polar bear musk ox interactions. Here's the library, it's only minus nine inside, but you find that there are no data. So instead you go and you dig out your snow machine, work with your Russian colleagues, you go look for animals, and you have, back to the beginning, black dots. So what do we do with the black dots? We've got our field experiments. What we're going to do is look through the eyes of the polar bear. We gather real data, not fake data. We gain insights, and we do experiments. And so notice here that, um, let's see. Here's the fake polar bear. No response by the musk ox. No response. But you get closer, defense. You get closer, what are they doing? They're fleeing. So what I'm going to do is to play for you a short little video what this actually looks like. Here's the important point. They ran. They ran from the polar bears. Let's go slightly deeper. We're going to do this in Alaska. 
and we're going to look at the response to a grizzly bear. And if I could turn the sound down a little, I would, but I'm not sure, so I'm just going to run with the video. Um. Then as I continue to approach as a grizzly bear, I ask, what is the distance when half the group notices? Then the I response is important here. Forget my voice. And then once they're clumped, I will continue. Then do they run away from me? Do they stay? Do they start to swivel? Okay, here's the point. They were not fleeing. So what we're looking at are very different responses. And then of course, because we're scientists, we have a control. And so the control is something that muskox are familiar with, a caribou. And so we do this with a caribou too. So when to stay and when to flee is the operative question here because it bears on a species response to changing ecosystems. Um, options are to flee or to stay. Do the bears chase or burn out? And so if we think about the flight by muskox from brown bears and polar bears, what we're finding is that muskox are fleeing four times more frequently from polar bears. We can ask what the distances of flight are, and we're finding that they're running further from polar bears. Here's the bottom line. This is what we know. Muskox are fleeing from polar bears, standing their ground from grizzly bears. The why question is important, but it's not central to this. What's more important is realizing that there's remarkable flexibility and that at least one of the species is starting to be able to respond in a way that might indicate persistence into the future. So summing up this part, we've got behavioral flexibility involving learning. We've got rain on snow events that are having long lasting effects on size. Why is this relevant? Well, there's relevance that's actually beyond the science that's pretty important. When we think about Beringia, when we think about the uncomfortable relationships we're now experiencing with Russia, there are scales of opportunity at the local scale in Russia, where we continue to work, where despite my being arrested last year, I'm invited back in a couple of months. I'm going to have Dan come with me as a bodyguard. Um, and then there are also regional opportunities to deal with some of this. Um, Starting under the George H. Bush um, regime, uh, presidency, um, his administration had facilitated the idea of transfrontier parks, cooperation in science. That still continues. That's why I'm able to work there. Muskox were reintroduced into Russia because the Russians asked the American government for help, and we complied. We've been able to put out a number of different op-eds in different places that continues to facilitate this kind of a relationship. All right, final vignette. I'm going to bring this closer to home. I'm going to talk about Western North America. I'm going to talk about long distance migration, and I'm going to talk about opportunities to sustain this in a country that has 310 million people or more. I'm going to focus on pronghorn. And I'm going to talk about migrations beyond parks. So pronghorn occur in 14 western national parks. Not a single one of those is large enough to contain their seasonal movements. So if we want pronghorn on the landscape, we need to find ways to assure with neighbors that pronghorn can move. I'm going to talk about Grand Teton, which is the south end of the Yellowstone ecosystem. Pronghorn there migrate to avoid deep snow. All animals go through what is called the Red Hills bottleneck from the Tetons. It's this box that's less than two football fields wide. Every single pronghorn that goes into and out of the Tetons, if they can't get through that box, the population collapses because migration is prevented. It's a univariate migration route that we've been able to identify working with the Park Service. All animals use only these trails. So our goal has been to protect this migration corridor. It's the longest migration of any terrestrial mammal between the Canadian border and Tierra del Fuego. I'll say that differently. Pronghorn do not migrate to Tierra del Fuego, but for any land mammal in all of South America and North America, south of Canada, this is the longest terrestrial migrant we have. So what we've done is to identify 
where the animals go. It's an invariant route. There are no alternative routes. The other 85% of the prior routes have been toasted. This is what's it. It's a complex jurisdiction of land, National Park Service land, Forest Service land, private land ownership, the hallmark of being an American, and then also Bureau of Land Management. So our approach has been to build support by working with people on the ground. County commissioners, we designated the area Path of the Pronghorn because that moniker offers process and place. It's easy for the public to identify what the heck we're talking about. We know that science is important. It's important, but it's a small, small part of the puzzle. But what it does when we publish our papers, we get a seat at the table, which is important, work with the decision makers. We've garnered local media coverage. We've worked at the national level. We've had op-eds in the New York Times in an era before the digital networks were really there. So no social media. So this was important and helped sway and carry things. We've worked with business communities to have annual celebrations and predictions when Pronghorn will return. We've had county support, Board of Commissioners, Chamber of Commerce. We've worked with the governors, uh, Western Governors Association, including then Governor Dave Friedenthal. We've had support letters from the agencies. And then we hit a block, a huge block. A lot of the pundits said, hey, this letter, and this is just symbolic. So when I would go out to counties, when I would go to places like Pinedale, Wyoming, other parts of Sublette County, um, other parts of Wyoming, I would talk about what is a symbol. And I would show slides such as these. Because people could relate. This is Rosa Parks. People could understand what a symbol is. They help spread a simple message that we're all in this. And so in 2008, then Secretary of Interior Dirk Kempthorne, under the George W. Bush administration, put in a million dollars, and we succeeded and had not only the US's first federally designated migration corps, still the only one that exists today. And so there are reasons for optimism. I think we can unite and we can take not just the science because we know that conservation is a word that means people and only people. If we can do this in Wyoming, why can't we do this in other places? I've been trying to use, and I am using, snow oxen as a metaphor of applying science to conservation. But I know that research is important, boots on the ground are important, as well as, obviously, if we can't connect with society, we're not going to have a chance. We know that the science is insufficient. We need, clearly, a broader message. So when Charles Darwin first voyaged through different parts of the world on the Beagle, he, he talked about evolution. He talked about natural history facts. He's not known for conservation. But 40 years later, he talked about conservation when he talked about the Aldabra tor tortoise. And he sent a protest letter in, uh, enjoining or attempting to the British government to stop losing habitat by cutting down forests. When Darwin did that, there were one billion people on the planet. Today, when we look at that, we've got more than seven billion. We know where the challenges are. The challenges are dual. There are many, but because people like you will continue, especially those who didn't vote in 1991 or later, we hand the torches to you. Thanks so much. And we probably have time for a couple of questions. Sir. So um, you mentioned the failure with the, with, in the cashmere example with goats and yak. What, what do you think the cause of the failure was? And what would success look like? OK, so the question, to repeat the question, is um, paraphrasing. What were the causes of the failure, and what would success look like? Um, so part of the causes were that, um, and I'm being filmed, so I'm going to be a little bit careful here. Um, there was a lot of 
competition amongst NGOs and agencies flexing and wanting more of the credit, more of the credit, more of the credit, and people couldn't get on the same page. People couldn't decide who should host workshops, who we should bring together, how we try to divvy up money. And it was a colossal cluster of personas that came together that didn't make it work. We haven't totally given up, but what we think success would look like at different levels, and of course this is a very, I mean the multi-billion dollar garment industry is powerful, generates a lot of jobs, brings a lot of good to a lot of places and to people, but at the same, on the, on the same plane, we're a consumer-based society. A lot of things don't necessarily have to find a place that we wear because there are substitutes. If we care about biodiversity, we have to reshape how we think about what we do in areas not in our backyard but far away because there are ripple effects, just like Leopold said. Every part plays a, has a role. Um, so success might look better with species like yaks, domestic yaks, with Bactria and camels, domestic camels, because their mouths are different, their impact on the land is less. And so getting people to think through how to do things differently and working with educational systems is one of the ways. Um, other questions? Just to follow, follow up from that question, there is predator-friendly wool. Is there anything you can borrow from from that, the strategies under that program for your biodiversity friendly pattern? Okay, good question. Um, I'll attempt that at the local scale, meaning in the western U.S. There are numerous producers, including some in Idaho, that use a variety of techniques to avoid killing predators, oftentimes with livestock guard dogs, um, which deter predation. These would not necessarily work in some other parts of the world, but there are, are opportunities that are being seized upon here, as well as in Europe, to minimize predation and then to advertise in ways that consumers might feel more compelled to buy from, purchase items from, realizing indeed that these are lessened impacts on the biological diversity that so many people seem to care about. Yes? Are the saiga being wiped out over there? Okay, question. Are the saiga, and maybe everybody heard, are the saiga being wiped out? Um, so, okay, two different um, ways to frame that. So, um, 1990s, when the Soviet Union collapsed, there were more than a million saiga. Um, a number of NGOs, WCS was not one of them, uh, advertised that saiga should be harvested and their horn replaced for rhino horn. Um, as a consequence, um, for a variety of economic breakdowns, Saiga went from over a million to less than 50,000 animals in a decade, so 95% decrease. Uh, Kazakhstan, a number of the other Stans put in place measures. Saiga numbers built up to over 400,000. 2015, disease hit, Saiga population was cut in half. They've come back a bit because they can have twins and triplets. Some females can hit puberty at six months of age. They're a very fecund species. Mongolia, which is very bare desert, has about 10 to 15,000 saiga. They got hit earlier this year um, with a disease brought in by goats and by sheep. Their population was halved, but we're looking at resistance and some rebounds. And so saiga have had a, a very tumultuous history, but right now, even though they're listed as uh, either T or E because of the rate of decline, they're actually doing okay. A number of countries have come together, um, and there are pretty good efforts focused on saiga. And Jerry's going to have the last word. Okay. Cool. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. We have a photograph here by Debbie Platt. We have a photograph for you by David Clack. He's a Colorado photographer, and this is on Colorado Slate. Thank you very much.